Hello and welcome to this A-level music technology lesson on condenser microphones. With microphones you need to know kind of have these three points of knowledge. Firstly you need to know a little bit about how the microphone is made or how it works more to the point um, and then you need to know about how that construction affects the characteristics um, the different strengths and weaknesses and different traits of the microphone types and then thirdly as an engineer you need to know how you would use those strengths and weaknesses to your advantage to get the right microphone for the right job so Firstly, you need to be able to identify a condenser microphone. And this is actually a bit trickier than, than it would was for dynamic microphones because there are two main types of um, of dynamic, of condenser microphone. You have large diaphragm condensers, which are these sort of studio looking microphones. They have a large mesh top. Uh, and these microphones are always side fire. So you sing into the side and you sing to the side with the company logo on, or uh, say in the case of this, which is the Rode NT1, there's a little dot to say, this is the front. Um, and it's easier than you think to, to sing into the wrong side and ruin your recordings um, as the front of this one. But they have quite often large kind of bodies below a, a mesh grill at the top. I've seen them shorter, I've got one which kind of stops about here, but really this style of grill at the top is, is key to identifying a side fire large diaphragm condenser. Uh, then you get small diaphragm condensers that we actually call, normally call like pencil microphones. They are smaller, they're very useful for getting into small spaces and getting quite close to instruments. They are pretty plain, so I think I've got another one here. Um, often with a few ports around the side. And when I compare that, I just bring up a dynamic microphone, a Shoem 57. You can see that they are, how's the best hold that? There we go. Somewhat smaller than even a pretty small dynamic microphone. Um, we use, we'll call these pencil microphones, but they work in the same way as the large diaphragm condensers. We'll get into some differences uh, in a minute or so. So firstly, how one of these works. I don't know if you can see in there, I'll just tilt it to see if uh, any light will come in. We have a, a capsule which is made out of two sheets of metal, conductive metal, electrically conductive metal. Uh, one of which doesn't move, it's a solid backplate, and one of which, which does. Now, the one that does is called the diaphragm, the one that doesn't is the backplate. And obviously what it does is kind of housed in a suspension so it will move back and forth and settle at its natural resting point when it's not receiving any sound. So sound comes in, if it's a compression in the air it will push the diaphragm towards the back plate. If it's a rare refraction in the air, if it's low pressure, the diaphragm will be sucked away from the back plate. Now with all condensers, and this is one key element, you have to send them power they need to, a base level level of power to work and we use something called phantom power which you'll find either on your mixing desk or on the preamp that you're using or if you've got preamps that are built into the interface it will be there uh, it will be labeled either as phantom power or more often it's just kind of plus 48 v it will say uh, 48 volts which is the level of power you send it takes this base level of power, it comes down the, the same cables, it doesn't need any special cables, just uses an XLR like, like all microphone types do. And it sends it up to the back plate or, or to one side of the capsule and then it comes back to the preamp, creates the circuit down the diaphragm or vice versa. Which means you have this kind of gap that the electricity has to jump between. And this creates a resistance in the circuit. So even when there's no, no sound, not that no sound can ever hit a microphone, um, I guess if it's in a vacuum, it will, um, it will have a base level of resistance in a microphone. Um, but as the sound moves the diaphragm, the level of resistance changes. Obviously, if a, so if we've got a compression that comes in and pushes the diaphragm towards the back plate, 
the resistance is reduced because the plates are closer together. Therefore, we see an increase in voltage. And kind of the opposite of that is if a rarefaction comes in and sucks away the diaphragm, obviously these are greatly um, exaggerated movements, we will see an increase of resistance and a decrease on the voltage. And that change in the voltage is what we can amplify and record as sound. Now this whole mechanism, this, this sheet of very fine, often gold metal, um, that is very fine metal, often gold, that should have been the way I should have said that, um, is very light. It doesn't move very far at all. We're talking, I don't know if it's microscopic, but tiny movements that can move very sensitively with the air that comes in. And that creates quite a very a highly sensitive microphone that can pick up um, very quiet sounds quite effectively. It can pick up harmonic detail. It reacts equally well to bassy sounds and high frequency sounds and mid-range sounds. It has what we call a flat frequency response. Um, not that flat's, flat's actually scientifically impossible, but much flatter frequency response than, say, a dynamic, which has quite a um, crafted frequency response usually and a very sensitive capsule. The downside is that they are quite weak. This entire mechanism is quite easily overloaded with very loud sounds. Um, it can't take really being dropped on the floor. You don't want to be dropping your condensers. It's quite expensive to buy um, because the materials are usually kind of precious metals or or you know valuable things um so whilst you get kind of a truer more sensitive recording you can't be sticking your condensers right next to drum kits or guitar amplifiers um but generally they'll create a more truer open recording and one of the reasons for this is that they have a wider pickup field even I should talk about polar patterns a bit more, but even in, in cardioid, if, you, if you've watched the dynamic, I'll, I'll go through cardioid being a, um, a monodirectional polar pattern. A polar pattern is just kind of a map as to where a microphone will pick up sound from. They're, they're wider, they're more open. You're not going to stick them right close to a sound source, so you get a truer, more acoustic-sounding recording. Um, however, with, with condensers, you, and unlike dynamics, you're not constrained to cardioid polar patterns. I mean, you do get quite a lot of condensers that are just cardioid, but this is a switchable one. I have a switch on the front. I can have a cardioid. I can have, which again, the one, the one directional, uh, what they say is figure of eight. I don't know if you can see that. Figure of eight microphone picks up equally from behind it as it does in front of it, but it rejects sound from the side. They're quite good for certain stereo setups. Um, sound coming in the back, by the way, would be out of phase of sound going in the front and you can also get omnidirectional which means it will pick up sound from all directions equally um, is, which is great for um, ambient recordings and if you're in a really nice room um, kind of using one microphone to capture very large sound sources so condensers in that way are good for uh, acoustic instruments, quiet sounds instruments, large instruments that have large sort of array of sound sources. You know, two good condensed microphones can record an orchestra, no doubt. Um, but they're not good at noisy environments. You need to be in a controlled environment like a music studio. You won't really find condenser microphones in a live situation much. And they're not good at very loud sounds like on being right next to drums or down the horns of brass instruments or right next to guitar amplifiers where they're easily overloaded and distorted. And these traits are kind of just amplified for the small diaphragm condensers because they also have the same construction of diaphragm but the diaphragm is even smaller, it's even lighter, it has a good high frequency response. Um, they're very practical, very practical for getting into small spaces and creating stereo recordings, 
kind of close to acoustic instruments and you don't disturb the performer too much because it's a physically small microphone. Um, they don't quite, the smaller capsules don't quite capture the fullness of sound as well as a large diaphragm does. So it's a bit of a trade off there, but for most acoustic instruments, guitars, acoustic guitars, violins, um, they're really good for that kind of close miking of this type of instrument. Um, these guys also have kind of different polar patterns. They they change normally by actually physically taking off the capsule and replacing it with with an omnidirectional one or a figure of eight one. Um, so that's it. So quick recap. They work with plates, solid one and a moving one, creating variations in electrical current. They are delicate, so they're not good kind of rough and ready microphones and you can't that delicateness means you can't put them next to very loud sounds like drums and electric guitar amps and bass guitar amps or down the end horn brass instruments um but they have good flat frequency responses they have switchable polar patterns which you can manipulate to capture different tones depending on the size of the the instrument you're trying to record or the sounds that you're trying to record and they have kind of a generally an improved sensitivity which means they're better at very quiet sounds or detailed harmonically rich sounds too.